start connecting um, principles actually out of uh, Achim's keynote. Uh, Achim is a uh, performance coach. He's also an author of uh, two books, uh, Infectious and Power Speaking. And I do have to say, um, writing a book about how to uh, present publicly uh, and then talk about a different topic and you're coming up on stage <laughs> and you're being measured against your own book, that takes a lot of guts. That takes a lot of guts. He's a performance coach. He has worked with uh, hundreds, hundreds of uh, executives, entrepreneurs, and um, around the globe. And um, uh, I do want to read this here for you guys, not to make a mistake. He's been featured on 60 Minutes, The Today Show, NPR, CNN, and uh, on The Last Enemy. So a uh, couple of uh, things he was featured on. He uh, lives in South Florida. He came up. We met down there. We talked a little bit about uh, what we're trying to do here at the Edge All Day. And um, he's going to give us some uh, advice about how to connect deeply. Uh, without further ado, I want to introduce Achim Novak. So hello, Agile New York. Good morning. I, uh, do I have an echo, or do I just sound like I have one? OK, so the sound can fix that. Maybe I'll talk a little more softly. I have to confess, when, when Joe called me and said, I want you to come to us at Agile Day New York and talk to us, my first thought was, so who the heck are these Agile people? And then he started talking to me about Scrum and Incrementer. And then I felt really stupid. And I felt like I have no idea what the heck you guys really do. So I called a friend of mine named Dan Treadwell, who teaches project management to a bunch of Fortune 500s. And I said, Dan, what do you know about these agile folks? And he said, they have some awesome technology. And they do some really cool stuff with project management. And night, I had the chance to break uh, break bread with some of you, and I was just impressed by some of the cool minds that you have in this community. So if you look at the slide, you know, I actually changed the title of what I'm doing. I'm calling it Agile Conversations because I, I love the word Agile. I love everything that it implies. Uh, I'm in the business of helping people to connect more deeply, and I see this all the time. You probably do as well as that folks who connect deeply with somebody are more successful. Uh, they get people to commit to them and buy into what they're doing. They get things done a lot faster. They're able to navigate around obstacles and barriers with a measure of grace. And they know how to engender a sense of joy in what's happening. So I, I celebrate your technology, but for the rest of the, this morning, I'm going to celebrate your personal agility as we're talking. I am not a big research geek, but here's some stuff I stumbled onto when I was writing my last book that it really grabbed my attention. Uh, and I'm going to just, just ask you to imagine something for a moment. Imagine I'm going to pick five people of you in this room at random. I'm going to take you to the lobby and I'll let you know that next week, Friday, you have the chance to pitch for a, a big project management contract. It's worth multiple six figures. But only one of you is going to win this contract. And because I'm a nice guy, before we do this, three days beforehand, we're going to have a little cocktail party. And I'm going to do something at this cocktail party that we don't normally do at a cocktail party. I'm going to electronically measure what folks at MIT call your honest signals. And honest signals are social signals that we send out as humans uh, and according to which we organize ourselves in relationship to each other. Most of them are nonverbal, and these are very specific to us humans. So the kind of stuff I'm talking about is how much do you gesture, how close you get to people, uh, how much you smile, how much you sweat, how much energy you send out. And here's the part I really want you to get. After I have measured your honest signals, I will predict who will win the pitch that Friday. I will not have seen your PowerPoint slides. I will not have seen your work documents. And I will correctly predict who's going to win it. That's pretty intense, right? <laughs> and this is exactly the research that they did at MIT, that the two guys named Sandy 
Pentland and Daniel Oldwin. MIT has, has an department called the Human Dynamics Lab, and that's all they study. And when those by Harvard Business Review, and they said, so what is the one honest signal that is the biggest distinguishing factor for folks who are more successful? The answer was personal energy. And I want you to know, I don't mean the rah-rah big energy, because we think energy means this hyper extrovert. It just means being energetically connected to who you are. And I love this research because I believe on, on the deepest level, we connect in the world that is not spoken. And it's very hard to figure out how to play with that stuff. So I'm going to share with you a bunch of techniques that I know from my work as a performance coach. Uh, these are pretty simple and straightforward. Absolutely anybody in this room can learn this stuff. And the beautiful part is this work in your personal lives as well. So you're going to have multiple benefits from what I'm talking about, OK? So here's what I know about folks who connect well. Uh, in my experience, folks who connect well connect on four different levels. These levels move from the visible to the invisible realm, from the surface to the core. And this is the tricky part. All of us play on all these levels all the time, but just don't play on them consciously. And I think folks who connect really well consciously play with this stuff. So let's take a look. The first level is what I'm doing right now, which is talking. That's the surface that we see in a conversation. And in my experience, great connectors uh, use language well, know how to use language to shape a conversation. And when it's done well, the skills and tools are invisible to the people that we're talking to. So it's fully assimilated, which is the beauty of that. The second level is, and this is a, a big word, but in my experience, folks who connect well are comfortable with their own personal power. By power, I don't mean ego. We'll talk about that later. And they're comfortable playing with the power of others. They're not afraid of the power of other folks. So we're getting to the invisible stuff right now. Folks who connect well also don't just sort of stumble into conversations. They, they walk into conversations with clear intent. And what I love about intent, intent is just a thought. It's free. It costs absolutely nothing. But we have to choose it really well. And the deepest level, this refers to the stuff that the folks at MIT were talking about, is, is the level of the energy exchange between people. Uh, so folks who connect well n know how they access their own energy. They're able to receive the energy of other people, and they're able to feel that exchange of energy. And when we play on all four of those levels, uh, magic begins to happen. Things start to unfold with a measure of grace. And that's a pretty cool thing. So I just want to walk you through some tips and techniques that I know uh, that I think make a difference. It's funny for me to talk to you here in New York, because I lived in New York for 20 years. And in the early 90s, I had an office a few blocks from here at the corner of um, Chamber Street and uh, near, near City Hall. And I was working for a social services agency in Manhattan. And we were, we were training young people how to become mediators. That was like a really fashionable skill in the early 90s. And if you don't know mediation, mediators learn how to paraphrase and validate and reflect back. and understand underlying issues. So it's a very sophisticated skill set. And that's not the stuff that we're going to talk about today. But this was my big aha moment when I trained young people to be mediators. Once they had internalized those skills, they felt incredibly empowered when they had any kind of conversation. Because they felt like they had tools about advancing a conversation in a way that they didn't have before. And they couldn't stop talking which frustrated some of their teachers, but they wanted to shape the conversations. But I realized when it comes to our business conversations, when we know how to shape them and influence them in a way that's elegant and not controlling, that's a pretty powerful skill set. So there are three very specific approaches that I want to share with you. Now, uh, like all of you, First of all, I'm a writer, so I love to write. I write constantly, and education these days is done in writing. Uh, we all can't stand long writing, right? Well, nobody wants to read a long email. 
you know, we text. I'm a, I'm a big tweeter right now, so tweets are very short, and I love the brevity of tweeting, uh, and everything is concise and to the point. But here's the problem. Uh, all of this communication is becoming essentially transactional. It's efficient. It's practical. But it doesn't necessarily engender an emotional buy-in to the messages that we're delivering. On a whole other front, I was always taught that if I want to influence a, a logical person, I should use logical language. And if I want to influence an emotional person, I should use emotional language. I don't believe that anymore. Like if you watch what Madison Avenue does, when Madison Avenue wants us to commit to a product from them, if we look at television commercials, those 30-second spots, there is very little logic in those. Like, they're very smart. They know on the deepest level, when we really commit to something, we commit on the emotional level. And all the images cater to that, because they know. So the challenge is, because in writing, we got rid of all the emotional cues, I find more and more people who, in person, talk as if they're writing an email. That's not a good thing, OK? <laughs> so how do we fix that? Uh, I'm a, one way we start establishing emotional connections is we put emotional cues, and those are good old-fashioned adjectives, back into our language. Simple stuff like, I'm excited to be here. I am happy to see you. I am frustrated with what's going on. Uh, I am thrilled that you're at this meeting. And if you choose the color that you want, and you might hear this language and go, well, that's just not me. If I were your coach, I would say, I don't care whether that's just you or not. The person on the other side needs to get the emotional cue from you. And we all have learned that language at some point. We've gotten rid of it. So I urge you to put it back in. I'm a great believer in having a strong and clear point of view and allowing other people a different point of view. Uh, I think especially, I, in my experience, in project management especially, I don't want to stereotype, very often we're working with people over whom we don't have direct authority. And we want to influence them to work with us and get engaged. So we tend to be afraid of having a strong point of view because we feel like we're not entitled to having it. And we tend to stay in neutral in our conversation. And neutral. I want to be clear, neutral does not advance a conversation. Neutral totally keeps it stuck. Uh, and the way we advance it is by having a point of view that doesn't mean being self-righteous. We have it, and then we allow somebody else to maybe have a different one. As a coach, I'm, I'm a great believer in muscle memory. This is how we actually learn this stuff. Uh, so I'm going to do just a very quick 30-second drill with you. And I want you to have some fun with it. So turn to somebody next to you. It's very simple. Uh, turn somebody next to you. I'm, I'm going to give you a point of view statement. And once I've said it, you're going to say it back to the other person. You're going to talk at the same time. So this is not a listening exercise. This is about you just strongly stating a point of view. Um, here we go. I'm going to say it, and you say right afterwards, the person next to you. I am confident this will work. You know what? We got to do better than that one. I'm sorry. That was a good beginning. Uh, I, I was an acting coach for a while, so have some fun with it and take it seriously, but put yourself into it. I am confident this will work. <laughs> Much better. I have no doubt that this is a great idea. Go. I strongly believe this will happen. I strongly believe this will happen. All right, you did good. And uh, don't worry, this is the only audience participation part I do. So you're off the hook, right? But as silly as that is, again, in my experience as a coach, unless I practice new language, it doesn't magically happen in the middle of a conversation. Does that make sense? So when I work with clients, as stupid as this is, I have them practice. I have them write out new language because it doesn't happen by itself. So you did awesome here. 
and really investigate playing with having a point of view and maybe look at all the situations where you go, you know what, I have a stronger point of view, but for some reason I am not saying it and practice saying it and notice how it will charge up the conversations that you're having. This is probably my favorite conversational skill, the ability to reframe a conversation. All of us have been in conversations where we're sitting there and we're going, this isn't going anywhere. You know, I am bored with this. We're getting off track. We don't want to have a confrontation with people. We don't want to argue, but we don't know how to shift it. So a great way to shift a conversation is to ask what I call a reframing question. By the nature of the question, we're changing the conversation. And the beautiful part of reframing question is the, the folks you're talking to don't even know that you're doing it. They just think Joe is asking a brilliant question. But Joe is asking a strategic question that will change the way the conversation unfolds. So these are just, there are more techniques than these four. I just mentioned four that I especially like. Widen the lens, narrow the lens, contemplate the opposite, and switch from problem to solution. Hopefully, just by, by reading the names, you get an intuitive sense of what those are. So I just want to give you one little example. Uh, since I, I, I may give you a Florida example since I live outside of Miami. Um, we're obsessed with real estate in Florida. We have constant conversations about real estate. And we're in the middle of a new real estate boom. So I'm not joking. This is a daily conversation. So the kind of thing that somebody might say to me on a daily basis down in Hollywood where I live is, there is way too much condo construction going on at the beach. And people will harp on that. How do I reframe that conversation? How does our condo construction compare to the construction in the rest of the country? Right. So I've taken it away from here to a broader conversation. It's a reasonable question, but I'm asking you to look at a bigger picture. So again, when I'm talking to somebody who's stuck in a very narrow conversation, ask a question that widens the lens. And again, it's elegant, and nobody will know that you're doing it strategically. That's the beauty of reframing a question. And as you watch the people that you're working with, notice the people that do this really well, because I'm sure you've seen all of them, and they're very graceful, and they usually get what they want at the end of a meeting. And you don't feel like you were manipulated, which is awesome. Now, this is a, this is a huge word. And, uh, and this is sort of the deeper level at which I believe we connect or don't connect. In my experience, if I consistently don't show up with uh, enough of my personal power, I'm diminishing the level at which I'm connecting with folks. And this was my personal aha moment around this. You're getting a bunch of New York stories from me. Like in the 80s, I was a, a workaholic theater director and acting coach in New York <laughs> with a very busy career and I totally into the 80s. And I did something I had never done in my life. I, I went to the desert in Sedona, Arizona for six weeks. And I went to a resort, and we did some really funky stuff. It would be fun to talk about it, but I don't have the time to tell you all those stories. But this is what I, this is what I remember. This place was run by a woman named Reverend Mona. Reverend Mona had blonde, spiky hair. And Reverend Mona came up to me one day and looked at me in the eye and she said, you need to stop being a doormat. And I paused. <laughs> and I got really pissed because I was a hot shot New York theater director. You know what I mean? The paper said I was talented, I was good, all this kind of stuff. But when I, when I settled back, I realized there were all the ways in which I wasn't fully showing up as a person. I wasn't owning my power, which means I wasn't connecting and as well as I could with people around me. And I got it right away. And it, it wasn't until a bunch of years later I realized that, that there are such things as power models where we can take a concept like power and make it specific and concrete. So I want to share with you a, a model that I work with a lot with my clients. Uh, I, like, I, I call them power plugs. And I like the word plug because plug means uh, this is a source of power I have that I can plug into. And if I plug into it well, it's going to change the way I connect with other people. Uh, I developed these together with a psychologist in Miami, and we had lots of debates about what the power plug should be. Uh, one of my biggest challenges was, I want to talk to you about all of them today, but I can't. 
So this is the overview, and I'm going to focus on one that I think is most important for our work in project management. So most of us have uh, some position power of our own, but we're often relating to other people who have a lot of position power. So we need to figure out how what we do with our position power and how we play with others, especially how we play with people that have a heck of a lot more position power than we have. The second level is, I think, folks who connect well own their relationship power. They know how to relate to people. They know how to establish relationships. And they know how to maintain them. And the beautiful part is, if that's something you feel like, oh, I could do this better, that can be learned. Expertise power, I'm assuming everybody in this room has expertise power. But it's not always easy to know how to use it well. And how to use it well when you're talking to somebody else who also has a lot of expertise power. So it looks obvious, but in my experience, it's not at all. Uh, body power boils down to me is how comfortable do I feel in my own skin. And there are many, many levels to that. But I know if, if I'm feeling crappy and I have the flu, my ability to connect with anybody is diminished. And people who feel comfortable in their bodies just exude a confidence, and they, as superficial as that seems, it's connected to that. The last one, charisma power. People always ask me to find out, what the heck is charisma? And it's one of those things where most of us feel like, if I'm lucky, I have it. And if I don't, I'll never get it. It's one of those things. Uh, if I gave you a 30-second definition, charisma to me is a, a primal sexual spiritual energy. And, you might, and I, I don't want to quantify it more than that. This is based on a lot of research I've done. It's available to every single one of us. For most of us, the channel to it is really tightly shut. Very few people come out of mama's womb with that channel open. And a lot of us have been socialized to shut it real tight. But there are ways to open it up more. And folks, folks who have charisma tend to walk into a room. They tend to light up the room. So it's a powerful social asset that they have. So my quandary is, I gave the overview, which one of these am I going to focus on? And I decided, let me focus on position power, because that gets played out in every business transaction that I see, that I have myself as well. Uh, yes. And the part about position power is, every one of us in this room, from the time we were little children and received a lot of powerful messages about how we relate to folks who have high social status or position. Usually this was not said explicitly. This was implied in some way. And we carry those stories. And so this is one of mine. And it's very, very clear in my mind. And I, I'm, I'm a German foreign service child. So part of my childhood was spent living in Turkey, in Ankara, with mom and dad. And once a month, the Protestant minister from Istanbul would come to Ankara and do a service. Now, my parents didn't give a hoot about religion. But you just showed up for the Sunday service with everybody else. It was a social obligation. But this is what I remember. I imagine if this was the hall where we had the service, the ambassador would sit in the front row, the cultural attache would sit somewhere in the third or fourth row, the chancellor would sit in the tenth row, and we sat behind the chancellor. So I got very early on that we were not very important. On top of what I noticed is when my mom had a chance to talk to somebody in the front row who was important, she would sort of almost like bow to them like a servant and whisper a little bit. And when somebody really important walked by, she would say, oh, that's, that's Mr. So-and-so. This sounds funny now, but hopefully it's clear. This kind of power story, I coach really, really powerful people now. I had to get rid of that. It doesn't serve me as a grown-up. I can't be the little boy who falls apart from coaching a CEO. And I can tell you a zillion stories. This is what Reverend Mona was talking about, where I did that because I didn't figure it out. So part of our personal homework, everybody in this room, is to figure out what the power story is. If it's getting in your way, get rid of it so you can play well with folks in position power. If I can give you a couple of specific tips and pointers. So if we want to relate well to somebody who has high position power, uh, I'm going to use a CEO named Bob who I work with. He's a CEO of a big $8 billion corporation. 
very affable guy, but I strongly encourage you to at some point explicitly acknowledge somebody's position power. For example, Bob, as a CEO, you've had to make some pretty tough decisions. Now, when I suggest it to some of my coaches, they say, that sounds like I'm sucking up to Bob. No, you're, explicit, you're explicitly acknowledging something that's real, and it's OK for him to know that. If you think it sounds like you're sucking up, that's your problem. And you need to figure that one out, because that's part of your power story. Does that make sense? Because you feel like any time you talk to somebody power, you're sucking up to that person. Another challenge is when we engage with somebody with high social power is to stay in the conversation and not disappear. Uh, Bob is a real person, and I've, I've coached most of Bob's executive team of 11 folks. And these, in this case, all, all men, <laughs> these men, uh, in my opinion, all have to figure out their own power stories. So I still watch them playing small around Bob and not always saying what they should say that would be helpful to Bob, which means they're not influencing Bob the way Bob wants to be influenced. You know, and so it's, it's that prevalent at the highest, most serious levels that we play that out. One way in which we can honor our own position power, folks who are comfortable with their own position power tend to be comfortable saying yes or no, rather than making commitments that they can't keep. And another way, it goes back to what I just talked about, is be comfortable and enjoy your point of view. That's another way of saying, I'm comfortable with my position power. Okay. And we're playing with the hidden stuff of connection right now. This is the stuff that goes on all the time. And I'm really looking to make us conscious of it so we can play with it. Uh, I love talking about intent because for the last uh, 25, 30 years, it's become um, a popular conversation in, in our culture, thanks to books like The Secret and the New Age Movement and stuff like that, which is really cool. Uh, a lot of those books talk about what I call our big life intents. But as a coach, I'm interested in every interaction I have with one person, intent gets played out moment by moment. It's very real and very specific. This is something that I know from working with actors. Anybody in here ever took, taken an acting class? Anybody? All right. Good, a few hands went up, awesome. So we, we tend to think that actors primarily learn their script, and they learn where they have to move. It's called blocking, and then they do stuff. What actors actually do, this is a great parallel to what I encourage us to do in life. Actors tend to take a script, they break it down into chunks, which they call beats. And in each beat, I'm going to use Joe as an example, because I know Joe. If Joe and I were acting together, I would say, in this beat with Joe, how do I want to impact Joe? And I come up with an action verb in my mind. Uh, might be like, I want to really irritate Joe. That might be one. So everything I'm saying comes with the intention to irritate. I don't suggest that as, as something in a business conversation. So this is for acting. That's fine, right? Uh, but it's really simple. Uh, the way we create an, a clear intent in a conversation is when we go into a chat with somebody is, how do I want to impact that person? It needs to be one verb. It needs to be clear. It needs to be simple. It needs to be a verb that excites you. The verb is never actually stated out loud. It's your own inner little secret. But whenever I coach somebody, is the moment that verb is clear in your mind, everything you're saying will come out differently because it is charged and colored by that verb. I'll be seeing people who enter a room and people who engage with a purpose have that figured out. There is a laser sharp focus to what they're doing. This part of intent is a little more complicated. I'm going to use myself as an example right now. Uh, one of the worst pieces of advice that I hear people giving other people is when it comes to going to um, a big business situation, people say, just be yourself. And I go, well, what the heck does that mean, right? Because I, be, just being myself, there are many different versions of Achim, many different sides of me. So I've got to decide which, which Achim is showing up today, right? The social role I'm in right now is, is I am the speaker. So just be yourself for this moment in front of 300 people is not enough. I have to make some choices and decisions, and I have to do it consciously. And you might like my choices or not. And I've learned to have fun with that. 
because we slip in and out of social roles. The other role I'm in right now, and all of you are in those, when you have to give a presentation in front of a group on a project, you are in the role that I'm in right now. And you need to make choices about how you show up and hopefully make that consciously. The other role I'm in is I am, because I've written some books, I'm supposed to be an expert on some stuff. So how we hold, and all of you are expert in the various technologies that you play with. How I actually hold that expert role is not as simple as it sounds. I have a good friend, her name is Dawn Denver. She's the director of training here at the United Nations. And she said to me, people want us to be the expert and they resent us for being the expert. Do you know what I'm saying? So we're always walking that fine line. If we overplay it, we piss them off. If we underplay it, we're the doormat that I was talking about. So how to actually own it, and I don't have the answer for us, but it's our job to figure that one out. Uh, last one, and this is one I want to share with you because I coach people on this all the time. The role that all of us stepping into all the time is the role of being a professional, and whatever that means. And for most of us, we have unexamined blueprints about what it means to be a professional. Uh, usually it's something like this, I'm smart, I know what I'm talking about, if I don't, I'm going to fake it, I'm certainly not going to let you know, and I'm going to play nice whether I like you or not, and I'll talk badly about you behind your back. <laughs> but I'll make sure I look good all the time. Right? Uh, there are many variations of this, but most of us are driven by unexamined notions of what it means to show up as a professional, and, and it behooves us to really examine it, play with it, and do it consciously. So have some fun with this role stuff, because if we don't figure it out, something in you is going to play out something around it anyway, and it probably is not going to serve you. And once we do it consciously, it's actually an enjoyable thing to do. Now, this is where we began, and this is where we're going to end, which is how, what this energy thing is. When I wrote my book, Infectious, I talked to a lot of energy experts, and I, I asked, so, so what is energy? And the answer everybody gave me said, well, everything is. And I agree, and what the heck do we do with that, right? <laughs> that's, that's not a very practical answer. Uh, I teach a class every summer in, in, in a university in Massachusetts in an MBA program. I remember last summer, I always ask the question, so how do we know that somebody has good energy? And a young lady named Matilda raised her hand, and she said, they're alive. And, and I thought that was a really good answer. And for me, alive means they are mentally alive, they're physically alive, they're spiritually alive, and they're emotionally alive. So that's actually a very nice, and, and when we are, folks on the other side really receive that. So it's powerful. In our culture, we have some pretty strong scripts about energy. Uh, a lot of us for the last 50 years have been taught a Jungian idea about how we get energy, which means everybody in this room probably has been told at some point or other you're an introvert or you're an extrovert, right? And the idea is that introverts tend to get energy from, from inside, from thinking, from reflecting, from being quiet. The idea is that extroverts get energy from other people and we're stimulated by that and that we're one or the other. Uh, Daniel Pink, who's an author who I really admire, said, screw that. I don't care whether you're an introvert or extrovert. To be successful in, in work, you need to be an ambivert. It means you need to be able to comfortably be introverted when you need to be, and comfortably be extroverted when you need to be, and not feel like you're not my, yourself. So get comfortable in playing with the range. Now the rest of the world has a whole other notion of energy. And I call it univert here, but it's the term that's more commonly used in most non-Western cultures is the idea of a life force. That there's an energy that courses through all of us. There are over 90 different terms on it all over the world. So the Hindus call it prana, the Chinese call it chi, the Japanese call it ki, and I call it the big energy. And what's powerful about this energy is it's bigger than being an introvert. It's bigger than being an extrovert. And it's available to absolutely everybody. And once we figure that one out, uh, people on some unspoken level receive it. And it changes the way we show up with folks. 
I wish I could teach you that stuff this morning, but I have time to really just introduce you to some basic approaches to hopefully whet your appetite around it. Um, how many of you are familiar with the chakras or have heard of them? Good. A lot of you. That's awesome. Uh, the chakras are really part of the Hindu story around energy, and the idea is that our spine is, our spine is really this, an energy superhighway. Like the energy travels from the base of the spine to the top of the spine, and there's, there's seven major energy centers, which for many of us have been shut. But we can learn how to open these energy centers. And each energy center, as you see, has a different color, and it's associated with a different part of our well-being. And if that interests you, you can study with somebody. You can learn how, they, how to open the chakras. And what happens is we start feeling the energy moving through the body, and we feel it moving in and out of these chakras. So suddenly, we're like this energy bubble that we weren't before. People tend to experience folks with the, who have the chakras open as just um, calm, centered, peaceful, and, and just comfortable with who they are. And and when one person with chakras open meets another one with chakras open, the, f the exchange of energy is amazing and things happen very quickly. Again, this stuff can be easily learned. Now, there's some other pathways. This one I sort of, it's tricky talking about. Who has heard about neuro-linguistic programming? Okay, a lot of hands went up. It's, I hate saying that word. It is so overly complicated. So I call it NLP for short. And there's a lot to NLP. It's a pretty sophisticated way of understanding human behavior. But on the most simple level, if you've studied NLP, you have learned to pick up how, how another person expresses their thoughts and ideas and use language, which is a way that we use energy, and to energetically match them through language. Another way that you learn with NLP, this stuff is very easy to learn, is if somebody speaks with a certain rhythm we match the rhythm of their conversation. Classic example is if I'm a fast talker like this and I'm talking to somebody who's very slow, you put us together, that's an energetic disaster, right? That's not a good conversation. If one of us knows how to match the other rhythm on an unspoken level, we get together. Uh, that's NLP. It's easily learned. If that interests you, check it out. Um, people who sell are often trained in this. People who do motivational speaking are trained in it for very obvious reasons because it gets us faster to deeper connections. There's a whole other bunch of disciplines that I put together. I call them the qi catalysts. I'm playing with a Chinese notion of qi energy. These are all physical disciplines that are often bunched together in our country as being wellness techniques. So it's acupuncture, yoga, Tai Chi, Qigong, Reiki, Alexander technique. Uh, what they have in common, most of them remain, involve repeating some kind of physical posture or a different way of aligning your body. And by doing it, we allow the energy to move more freely through us. And again, it opens up the energy pathways. And by doing it, we're able to send more energy to other people. And we're able to receive more energy back. And the beauty of all of this stuff is, if I can make a big pitch for doing this, all of these things make us feel really good. <laughs> so there's an immediate payoff. If you're a hedonist like I am, you will enjoy this. This stuff feels good. And it will immediately translate into you connecting with people on a level that we often don't get to. So folks who connect deeply and connect well are the folks who play consciously on all four of these levels. They use language consciously and strategically, and they have internalized their language skills so well that it just becomes the way that they talk. It's effortless. It doesn't require lots of thinking. They're comfortable with their own power, and they're not afraid of the power of other people. They show up in most social situations with clear and conscious intent. And they know how to access their own energy. And they know how to receive the energy of others. And they know to how to have a sense of flow energetically between folks. And once, once we get there, uh, in my experience, some pretty magical stuff starts to happen. 
uh, in the 12 step programs they call this the promises. And the promise is what happens when people get out of their own way. So uh, I, I thought I'd just read to you a little transcript of a conversation that I had. This is a real conversation I had while I was writing my book. Uh, this story for me is an example of the promises when it comes to doing this work. And before I, I read this, this conversation to you, there are just two, two images I, I want to invite you to entertain. In my, I, every conversation is, is a ride into the unknown. Uh, in the best conversations, the role of the driver and the passenger are easily shared and shift back and forth. So that's one thing I would love to aim for. Uh, in a great conversation, also, there are lots of doors that could be opened. Each door is a door to exploration and possibility. And our job is to notice the doors and choose to open them. And it, it, it's sort of funny for me to read this story because I just gave you the metaphor. But this is a story of an actual car ride. So I'm going very literal on you right now conversation that I had with a taxi driver in Chicago. Okay. It's midday afternoon in Chica downtown Chicago on a sweltering August day. I dash out of the Wyndham Hotel and hail a taxi to head to O'Hare Airport. I slide into the back seat and pull the door shut. The cab, as it turns out, is an old Lincoln Mercury that has seen better days. The windows are cracked wide open and the air conditioning is not on. Author, can we turn on the AC? Driver, why don't you move to the front seat? I immediately get that it will be easier to cool just the two seats in front of the plexiglass petition. I jump out of the car and plop myself into the seat next to him. The air slowly comes on. Driver, you know, your glasses look intimidating. <laughs> he says it to me seconds after I slide into the seat next to him. I look at him for the first time, really, as he utters these words. He's a wiry, dark-skinned man, short in his late 60s, I guess. He leans into the steering wheel with a slight hunch as he drives. I'm surprised by his comment, surprised because he said it, and surprised because two nights earlier, I had dinner with my friend Vivian Isaac in Philadelphia, and the topic of my glasses had come up. <laughs> Author, these glasses are a little nerdy. I kind of like that look. Then I decide to tell him about my dinner with Vivian. Author, I had dinner with a friend in Philadelphia two nights ago. I had not seen her in a couple of years, and she had not seen me with these glasses. She said to me right at the start of dinner, you know, I like these glasses, but you look intimidating in them. <laughs> Maybe you both are right. Maybe I do look intimidating. We banter back and forth about the implications of this coincidence. Driver, it's only two comments. This is not statistically valid. The <laughs> variance is too great. I notice that he has a slight accent as he speaks. Accents fascinate me, and, in his, and his speech reminds me of some of the men I met when I lived in Tobago. Author, where are you from? Driver, my mother's womb. <laughs> I am both amused and annoyed by his answer. I know I won't settle for this quip of his. Author, you know I lived in Trinidad and Tobago for a while. I have a hunch you're from somewhere down on the island. Driver, guess. Author, I won't guess, just tell me. <laughs> I hear the irritation in my voice. Driver, the Cape Verde Islands. Do you know where they are? Author, I do. Do you know the music of Cesaria Evora? Evora is a singer from Cape Verde who has gained a large international following. Driver, yes, I do. So what kind of music do you like? I have many answers to that simple question, but as I decide to tell him the first thing that comes to my mind. Author, I like trance and electronic music. I like it because it's mindless and I don't have to think when I listen to it. 
I have the new Britney Spears CD in my car stereo right now. I listen to it over and over. I think Britney, Britney Spears is actually a god-awful singer, but I like this CD. Driver. I like classical music, and I like jazz. Author. I like that music, too, sometimes. And then I remember my other kind of music. I practice Hinduism. I often go to an ashram in Miami where I meditate and where we chant in Sanskrit. I also love that kind of music. He looks at me and says nothing, drives on in silence. After a pause, he responds, driver, I have been meditating for many years. You know, everything in life is about energy. And meditation is a way in which I connect with energy, all of the energy. My driver has no idea that I'm in the middle of writing a book about energetic connections. Author, I like chanting in Sanskrit because the words and the chants carry an incredible energy. He turns off the classical music station that has been playing. Driver, here's the mantra I chant when I meditate. He proceeds to chant for me. It is a low wailing hum that seems to grow in volume as the sound extends. I notice his deep voice, deeper than his speaking voice, and hear the vibrations and the hum sound. He stops after 20, 25 seconds. Then, as if for emphasis, he chants a second time. When he's finished, we both are silent for a little while. Driver, did you notice a smile on my face when you told me you chant? This comment of his makes me smile. I say nothing. Driver. There are no accidents in life. I hardly ever ask any, anybody to sit up front with me. It has been years since I've asked anyone to move up. I glance at him and notice again how wiry his body looks, how he seems to hunch forward with such determination as he drives. Driver, most people don't know what is real. They think this car is real. They think these seats are real. They think what they say is real. The true reality is what we discover in the silence. I grunt in agreement, and I marvel at where he's taking the conversation. Driver, do you ever leave your body? Author, yes, I have experienced that a bunch of times. I remember having this sense that I, whoever that is, am hovering high up in the sky, and I'm looking down on the room in which I am, and I'm watching myself as I'm interacting with people in that room. Driver. So you have traveled to the astral planes. Wait till you get to the celestial ones. Some really beautiful things are waiting for you there. Our ride continues with stretches of silence, interrupted by bursts of chatter. My driver tells me about the time in his life when he began to meditate over 35 years ago. I tell him of my visits to Mother Mira, a spiritual leader from India, and my experience of the darshan ritual with her. As we pull up in front of the United Airlines terminal at O'Hare Airport, I grab my wallet and I'm surprised that we got here so quickly. Driver, I am glad I got to drive you today. You have given me joy for the rest of the day. Author, thank you for the ride and thank you so much for the conversation. After I pay the fare for this ride, he repeats an earlier comment. Driver, and remember, there are no accidents in life. And that's the end of the story. Ah. Now, I, I'm not suggesting you run out immediately and grab a taxi on Broadway and shut up your cab driver. That's not the message of the story. Even though I've had amazing conversation with taxi drivers because we know we are, we're never going to see them again. And it's a great opportunity to take personal risks in conversation. So it's actually fun. But my hope for all of you is that you will leave today and start playing with the four levels that I talked about. Know that these skills work in your personal and in your professional lives. Notice the doors, open them, and please go ahead, uh, have fun, and enjoy the ride. Thank you. Do you need that?